climate deal. Just recently, the Marine Environment Protection Committee, part of the International Maritime Organization, held its 80th assembly to agree on a united strategy for greenhouse gas emissions in shipping. Member states have set a target to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by or around 2050. They have also agreed on implementing a global fuel standard and that greenhouse gas emitters will have to pay a levy on their emissions. This episode examines where the shipping industry currently stands on climate and greenhouse gas emissions regulations while also looking further into the future here on the brink of upcoming changes and implementations. This is Beyond the Box, integrated logistics from the inside out. Welcome to the fourth episode of Beyond the Box. My name is Morten Butler. And I'm Gyo Cecilia Ross. Today's agenda, a temperature check on the green transition of container shipping and logistics. You very much said temperature check intentionally, didn't you? Absolutely. We're talking climate today because global shipping is, believe it or not, responsible for around 3% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, as one of the most polluting industries, shipping really has a long way to go. This is at a time in history where we're seeing more wildfires and heat waves and so-called a thousand year events uh, than ever. So what better time to change the industry? Momentum seems to be building with both new and more sustainable vessels on order and also new regulation. Yes, and speaking of regulation, there recently was a meeting in London between member states of the International Maritime Organization, or the IMO for short, to (laughs) save a little breath for me. The IMO is a specialized UN agency responsible for ensuring safety and preventing pollution. Right, and the member states actually agreed to a revised climate strategy, finally, some might say. We've spoken with Susan Rufo, who works as Senior Advisor for Ocean and Climate at the United Nations Foundation. For the past 15 years, she has been developing and implementing programs and policies focused on advancing conservation and combating climate change for both non-profit organizations, but also for the White House under President Barack Obama. She was in London at the meeting, and this is her explaining the importance of IMO and the MPEC agreement. So the International Maritime Organization was established in 1948 because there was a recognition that as ships go across international waters, they're outside the boundaries of any country. Um, And so things like safety and pollution needed some way Uh, to be regulated, we needed some way to do international cooperation, and so the IMO was established to deal with this international industry. I mean, most people don't think about shipping in their day-to-day lives, but about 80% of everything that we use, that we eat, that we wear, comes by a ship. So if we think about how we decarbonize our economies um, and our lives, shipping plays a really big part of that, even though we don't see it. And unlike other sectors like agriculture, the emissions from shipping are outside of any other agreement. So the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change only covers national emissions. It doesn't cover emissions uh, on the international side. So on international waters, it doesn't cover shipping, it doesn't cover aviation. So the International Maritime Organization is really important for dealing with those emissions that are outside of the Paris Agreement, um, but that are a big part of what the world needs to reduce. And if you think about it, shipping is about 3% of global emissions, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's roughly the equivalent of Germany. So if you think about reducing all of Germany's emissions, that was, that's what we're talking about here when we talk about shipping. You know, For those of us who follow international negotiations, I think this was a really exciting meeting. One of the big decisions that was expected was this new set of targets and how much the IMO would decide that they Um, want to reduce emissions in the sector. The goal going in um, for the most progressive countries and civil society and industry was to reduce those emissions to zero by 2050. Um, And with some very significant targets along the way for 2030, for 2040, to really set up, you know, very strong trajectory for emission reductions. Um, The outcome that came out was not quite that. It was not fully Paris aligned. But what did come out was an agreement to essentially reduce emissions to net zero by 2050. 
Um, and I think that's a really big deal, particularly when you look at the fact that the previous target was 50% by 2050. Um, so that's a significant move. The other piece of that that's important is they agreed to some interim checkpoints for 2030 and 2040, reducing emissions you know, 20 to 30% by 2030, 70 to 80% by 2040. So if you look at that, those are, those are some pretty strong targets that um, industry and others will be expected to meet. So now we have a basic understanding of this agreement, an agreement that received a lot of media attention, I might add. Why, you ask? Susan Rufo explains. So the IMO's Marine Environment Protection Committee is the committee within the organization that's responsible for looking at all environmental issues. And it is basically the governing body for all of those issues. So the decision that it makes are the decisions that the IMO will adopt. So the MEPC meeting in July was particularly interesting because it was the meeting in which the IMO member states finalized their new revised greenhouse gas strategy and set their new targets for how much they're going to reduce emissions from the sector. You know, normally people don't really know what the IMO is. They don't pay attention to it. It it doesn't really get a lot of press. But this meeting actually did get quite a bit of attention because it really was setting the course for the sector for the next probably several decades. And the decisions they were making were about how much the sector was going to change, how much it was going to decarbonize, and whether or not essentially it was going to help us stay on a Paris aligned trajectory. The big question is, of course, if they succeeded, like truly succeeded, and what does success even look like? Depending on who you ask, you'll definitely get different answers. But Morden, to begin with, you asked Simon Bergolf, who is the Public Affairs Group representative for Europe at Mask, what were his thoughts on the agreement? Well, he was very positive, particularly about the fact that the industry now has a joint target for reaching net zero greenhouse gas emissions. It was a truly a historical meeting and, and I'm very happy we were there. Uh, I have to say in the beginning of uh, of the negotiations, we probably weren't as positive as, as we ended up being. And uh, and and I remember we sat um, in the in the room on the Wednesday afternoon, late afternoon, and suddenly we could feel the whole room shift in terms of the ability that suddenly an agreement was was in reach. And we hadn't felt that before. And that was a pretty special moment to be in that room because we could just we looked at each other and I remember looking at at my colleagues and others and saying it's happening now and and thankfully then we ended up with a very positive adoption of not only a, a net zero by 2050 which I think was really what was required and I know that for some the the language could be a little bit sharper but to be honest it's not it's not a big issue in my book uh, we have a by 2050 so uh, uh, for us that's what we're going to look at and work towards with the IMO as an institution but more importantly I think that the ability to agree on a timeline for measures that include a fuel standard and a price on emissions by 25 adoption by 25 that's in two years time and roll out by 27 I, I don't think anyone could have hoped for a better outcome in terms of uh, of getting that done in order to accelerate the green transition of the industry, more countries, more companies need to be involved in producing the green fuel and the engines that can actually burn the fuel. Yeah, makes sense. But before we cue the fireworks and begin celebrating the deal, it might be interesting to hear from someone with no financial or business related interest. We've spoken to Rasmus Bjerg Larsen, who works for Green Transition Denmark, a non-governmental organization. Our assessment of the IMO deal is a bit uh, twofold, you could say. So on the one hand, we have now a clear direction that, that shipping has to decarbonize. And on the other hand, the deal could clearly have been improved by being uh, more uh, stringent about the timeline to set 2050 as the date when shipping has to be decarbonized. Then I think also... The kind of uh, targets on the way to 2050, I mean, for one uh, thing, they are now called intermediate checkpoints. I, I think it, of course, it would have been uh, it would have been more clear to, to the industry what's going to happen if it had been actual targets. And what does this uh, intermediate checkpoint, what, what does that precisely mean? I, I think it would have, have been uh, stronger to have like a, a clear target. Okay, so this is also what Simon Bergolf mentioned just before, this discussion around the wording of the agreement, which in the larger scheme of things seems a 
bit benign or irrelevant to me. Yeah, but words matter. It boils down to a fear of prolonging the end goal or result. If the deal says around 2050, could it then be 2052 or 2060? It really becomes more a matter of interpretation instead of just being a definitive number or clear deadline. But that's definitely not a concern for Simon Bergulf, uh, the group representative for Europe and Mask. He's truly excited about the revised IMO GHG strategy. I was uh, like a child on Christmas morning when uh, when the timeline was adopted. When I saw that we stuck to 25 and 27, that was a pretty amazing moment when we saw that that uh, sail through. So the the fuel standard is uh, is an often overlooked important measure, and everyone is 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 a lot talking about the price on greenhouse gas, and and rightfully so probably. But it's a it's a little bit the less loved uh, little brother or so I could say of measures when you're talking about a, a fuel standard. But it is actually massively important. What was put forward at the IMO is a fuel standard where actually you had a minimum of five percent and um, uh, two ten percent. Uh, fuel mix, green fuel mix uh, in your in your fuel mix. So you would have to have five to ten percent green uh, maritime fuels when you're sailing. And to give you an an, an idea of uh, of whether that's ambitious or not, the EU's own target uh, for that maritime fuel mix is at six percent in 2030. So it's actually relatively aligned with with one of let's say the most ambitious regions in the world when it comes to climate action. What Simon says here is a core challenge for the green transition. And green fuel scarcity will only worsen if there isn't a significant uptick in production with so many new vessels in the order books and with other industries demanding the methanol as well. According to Green Transition Denmark, the market would already be acting differently if the wording of the IMO deal had been stronger. Here's Rasmus Bjerg Larsen. Yeah, so so looking at the deal, I think the consequences will be, well, they are here already because uh, if we had had stronger language on the on the emissions uh, reduction trajectory, then uh, actors in the market would already now be acting differently than what they are doing with this deal. I think it's fair to say that the level of excitement isn't quite on the same level here. But I suspect that Asmus Bjerg Larsen and his peers prefer this agreement over no agreement at all. And that's of course due to the massive importance for the environment and the climate. Yes, this is the IMO member states taking climate or climate change seriously. But if the end of the world isn't enough of a motivating factor, perhaps business, or let's spell it out, money might just be. So besides reducing greenhouse gas emissions for the sake of the climate, these changes also have a financial value. Just hear Siemens chair, Jim Heyman Snebu. It's not just important for the planet, it is also becoming very important for the customer. You know, many companies have uh, declared intent to uh, reduce their own CO2 emissions, Um, but nowadays they begin to look into uh, scope two and three, and then suddenly logistics uh, plays a major role for many, many companies. Uh, I look at a company like Siemens, a global operation, uh, truly global. we um, begin to see the supply chain as a strategic topic and of course our increased commitment around sustainability scope one two three makes it even more strategic i think if you want to accelerate progress you always have to look at the inhibitors and and the concerns and and some of the concerns are often related to, to cost the industry has been used to a, a very volatile price so there's a lot of price bargaining in the industry If I look at it strategically, the price is actually less important if someone can guarantee the delivery on time. Um, And if someone can guarantee a zero carbon delivery. And so I think this is an opportunity to get out of the commodity game um, where price, of course, will always be important, but it can't be the only thing. Yeah, so according to Siemens chair Jim Heyman Snape, who by the way used to be the chair of Mask, this is a strategic matter for companies. They're increasingly investing in reducing scope 3 emissions, which are the indirect emissions registered in a company's supply chain, for instance. That makes perfect sense, which is why I feel the need to ask why so many setbacks. I mean, why aren't we further along in the process? 
Let's hear what Susan Rufo of the United Nations Foundation and Simon Bergulf, who joined MASK back in 2009, have experienced along the way. From my perspective, what I've seen, you know, over the decade plus that I've worked on climate change is it's getting increasingly urgent. And you see that in the public messaging that come from people like the Secretary General, you see it from President Biden here in the US, you see it from global leaders everywhere, um, you see it from local communities. I think one of the frustrating things for many people is that in spite of this sense of urgency, um, what actually happens in a UN negotiating room or at a climate cop that often get a lot of press seems to be so small um, and you know often just doesn't have a lot of real on the ground change. So I think for me, one of the exciting things that I've seen in the last few years is real actors like industry, like cities, like mayors that are really stepping up and taking action and, you know, following what happens at the international level, but making it real. So in, in 2009, what uh, what the situation was, was extremely different from what the one that we are seeing today. And uh, and back then, it wasn't uncommon to have uh, to have climate denial uh, as a real topic, to have the question whether climate change was actually real. Um, it seems completely impossible today that that was even a possibility, but I've sat in meetings where this was raised as a question. Ten years later, uh, in 2018, uh, the IMO adopted its first strategy, uh, and so did MASK, uh, and that was a 50% reduction, uh, at least 50% reduction in, in greenhouse gases in 2050, and five years later, uh, now we are at a net zero in 2050. So we could just see how the pace accelerates, uh, and, the, and the climate denial has more or less disappeared. It's just been replaced by what I would call climate delaying now. So there's still tactics to delay the necessary measures. Um, but but at least there's no more denial of climate change being real. I think I've been in a state of blissful denial, to be honest. I at least find it crazy to be reminded of the fact that we only have to go 14 years back in time to have the discussion whether climate change is man-made or not. I know. It seems similar to discussing whether the Earth is flat or not. Yeah, and I mean, we all know it is. <laughs> flat. Uh, I think you need a vacation, good. I do, I do. So to sum up this episode and get on with it, Morden, hit us. All right. So there's an increasing customer demand for green solutions in supply chains. Global regulation is starting to catch up, and actually already within the next few years, we'll have a sense of whether the new climate strategy for shipping is bringing the industry closer to net zero by 2050. Oh, and also, the Earth is not flat. Beautiful. Thanks, Morden. And thank you to our reporter, Anke Tata, our producer, Elin Hoffman, and to all you guys listening. Remember to subscribe so you never miss an episode. I can already say that the next one will continue this green path We're talking, are you ready? This is sexy, fuels. Bye.